This is Bible Academy. I'm Pastor Teacher Curtis Omo, and today we continue in Romans 15. We'll be starting at verse 8. Now before we get started, as always, let's make sure that we have confessed our known sins and that we are controlled by the Spirit of God. Let's pray. Well, Heavenly Father, we thank you again for this privilege, the opportunity, everything that you have provided for us to study your word. We ask that our hearts and minds will be open to your truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Romans chapter 15, verse 8. Paul now brings this section to a conclusion. He has been writing and instructing the Roman Christians that whether they're weak or strong, Jew or Gentile, basically to get along, not make issues out of non-essentials of the Christian faith. Anything along that line that would lead to unnecessary disputes. Now there will be differences, we know that, as there is differences between every believer and their beliefs. But when it comes to a church situation and groups like this, you have to be especially careful so it won't lead to some sort of division. Now as Paul brings this section to a close or conclusion, he gives two purposes of Christ's work and ministry and then provides Old Testament support. And of course this is related to the Jew and Gentile relationship with God. Let's look at verses 8 and 9 together. Romans 15, 8 and 9. For I say that Christ has become a servant of circumcision on behalf of the truth of God to confirm the promises given to the fathers, and that the Gentiles on behalf of his mercy glorify God, just as it is written. Therefore I will give praise to you among the Gentiles, and will sing to your name. So let me just give you an overview of these two verses as we get into this pattern that Paul presents. The first purpose is in verse 8. It regards Christ and a servant of the circumcision, which is the Jews. The second purpose is presented in verse 9 regarding the Gentiles and them receiving mercy from God, and that all glorifying God. And then he begins his scripture support in the second half of verse 9. All right, now let's look a little closer. The first purpose. For I say that Christ has become a servant of circumcision. A servant of circumcision here, of course, refers to the Jews on behalf of the truth of God, to confirm the promises given to the fathers. Now we've studied many of those promises. Some of them developed into the covenant or covenants. And we've seen that these promises, uh, we started with Abraham. It included a land. We learned later that there would be a king through David, a multiplication of the people uh, through uh, the promise to Abraham and that there would be an extension of blessing to those who blessed Israel. And we talked about the seed also. Christ was the seed. And then as Gentiles are brought in, they share in that blessing with the Jews. We've learned that the Jew was the target audience of Christ. Christ came to the Jew first. So here we spend a moment looking at this concept of Christ becoming a servant of circumcision. He did that by coming to the uh, Jews, his own countrymen first, his own people racially. Another thing, Christ himself said 
and Matthew 12, 54, excuse me, 15, 24, I was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. That's in Matthew 15, 24. So let's write this down and think about it for a few moments. Christ, servant to the Jews. That's the first principle Paul is telling us about. And Scripture certainly supports that. As not only did Christ say it, but that's what he did, and that's how it's recorded in history. Also, when Christ gave directions to his disciples, Matthew 10, 5, and 6, these twelve Jesus sent out with the following instructions. Do not go among the Gentiles or enter any town of the Samaritans. Go, rather, to the lost sheep of Israel. So here we see Christ also instructing the disciples who would come become the apostles to go to Israel also. They were God's people as a race, as a nation, and as they were scattered around the world, they were still his elect people. By that I mean those were the ones who God had planned in his uh, salvation plan to not only become believers, but to lead the world to God. In doing so, this fulfilled the promises given to the Gentiles, the people of Israel. As we see in our verse again, let's look at that purpose. To confirm the promises given to the fathers. Christ fulfilled uh, the promise to David that he'd have a son. Christ fulfilled the other promises like he would be the prophet. Uh, we learn later that he is the Savior. He is the suffering servant in Isaiah. So Christ was the fulfillment of the predicted Savior that would save the believer from sin and condemnation. We also see, as we come into the book of Acts, Acts chapter 2, it was the people of Israel that received the first installment of the kingdom of God with the coming of the Spirit in Acts 2. So when again and again, Christ came to the Jews first. He served them in many ways. God set up his program to target the Jews first whether it be from the standpoint of Abraham and the promises all the way through the fact that the Savior would come from them and it was from Israel or through Israel that the world would be blessed. That brings in the Gentiles. Now, Abraham, when he was promised by God that developed into the covenant it was said that those who blessed him would receive blessing we also learned about the seed that meant that this blessing to the Jews would come to the Gentiles now think about our passage overall since we started back in chapter 14 it was about the weak and the strong the Jews considered the weak, the Gentiles considered, just considered the strong, and that was over the issue of the law, right? Which was becoming still a divisive issue. So now Paul is going to the roots of the teaching of the Old Testament to continue to show that Christ had a purpose for the Jews, under the law, by the way, and then because of the Jews' rejection, which we've learned in Romans, the gospel would become uh, effective towards the Gentiles. And then we see that pan out historically. Christ came to the Jews, his disciples were sent to the Jews, and then as the Jews rejected, the door was opened up for the Gentiles. Along comes Paul, 
He's the apostle of the Gentiles. Even before that, we have Peter, who was sent to the Gentiles in Acts 10. So, what we're saying here is that though we started out with the Jews, the program, the program opened up to the Gentiles. Remember, when Jesus was about to ascend to heaven, he instructed his disciples. We see this in um, uh, uh, the, what they call the Great Commission. We see this also in early Acts that he had told his disciples that you're going to go out to Samaria and then into the rest of the world. They went to the Samaritans in Acts 8. In Acts 10, we have the record of them going to the, let me write that out, Samaritans in Acts 8. In Acts 10, they went to the Gentiles. And that basically is the rest of the world. Let me read to you Acts 1.8. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes to you, or on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, and all Judea, that covers the southern part, and Samaria, that's the central part, and to the ends of the earth. Now that Judea and Samaria, of course, is what we would call the Palestinian area today. And to the ends of the earth. Basically, this extends it to the Gentiles. So what we want to see here, at the beginning of chapter 14, it's the weak and the strong, the Jew and the Gentile, that was all part of God's program to bring those two together. Now Paul's saying, you need to get together. You need to get along. You are the body of Christ. You are representing Christ on earth together as his church. God doesn't miss anything. He always intended to reach the world with the gospel message. Now, let's talk about a couple of side issues as we talk about the Samaritans and the Gentiles. Let's talk about the Samaritans first. As you may know, the Samaritans are a mixed race of Jews and other races uh, that came along because of the integration of uh, these other races into the Jewish lands because of uh, captivity and uh, nations like Babylon sending uh, other people into the area of uh, Judah and mixing in marriage and producing the Samaritans. They were looked down upon by most Jews and you see that story, or those stories, I should say, in the Gospels. So they were a different audience than the Jews. So what we have, let's get this little timeline up here. This is a short timeline. By that I mean it covers a short period of time, okay? Uh, let's say like 50 years. So we have the cross. All right. And then in... Uh, Acts 2, let's just say this is Acts. This timeline represents Acts. In Acts 2, you have the New Covenant come to the Gent of the Jews on the day of Pentecost. All right? It was demonstrated, that is, the coming of the Spirit through the speaking of tongues and miracles and uh, the people being told to go out and witness to their parts of the world. Uh, they saw these miracles. They saw the manifestation of the Spirit. And there was a special outward manifestation of the Holy Spirit in Acts 2 to the Jews. Later on in Acts 8, you have a special manifestation to the Samaritans. So God was still using this miraculous method to demonstrate that the program was reaching out not only to the Jews but then to the Samaritans. Then we have the story of Cornelius in Acts 10. 
where there's a very detailed account of both Peter and Cornelius eventually coming together and his household and the Gentiles receiving the Holy Spirit. And you have such things, the laying on of hands and baptism, and again, the speaking of tongues and miraculous manifestation. And there's a couple of other occurrences down the road, we're not going to get into those, that were specific to John's disciples and some stragglers that had never heard of the Holy Spirit. So they too, during this short time period, were giving these special were given these special manifestations of the Holy Spirit. That was all during this transition period. What was the transition? From the Old Covenant to the beginning of the New Covenant, right here. And this period continued on until the transition was over and then all these special manifestations of the Holy Spirit would stop. There was no purpose for them to continue. And this is where we got to be careful. We don't take this short transition period where this special event of the Old Covenant being phased out, the New Covenant being phased in, the Holy Spirit coming in for the first time, all right, to these different groups until basically they're all covered and then this special manifestation ends. All right. We also had during this period sign gifts and we see that through uh, even the book of Corinthians. But that starts to close down by the time you get to Revelation. Uh, John is the last prophet. He's the last one receiving revelation, direct revelation from God, the last one writing it down. So by, by the end of the New Testament, that is, once the books have been written, not compiled, not gathered together, but once all the revelation had been given, these sign gifts end. They no longer were necessary. They basically had a few purposes. One was to authenticate the writer and speaker that he was from God, all right? It was also a sign to show, and this is drawn from Isaiah in the Old Testament, that, uh, for example, tongues was a sign. If, if you start hearing tongues in your land, then it was a sign of coming judgment. Tongues would be foreigners, and that was symbolic of coming judgment. Uh, Paul writes of that too, all right? So, once the transition period is over, the sign gift, the sign gifts uh, end, the manifestation of the Holy Spirit by this laying on hands and tongues all end also. Now, let me just comment here on the side. Knowing these facts, what I've got here on the board, look at what that involves. It involves studying the book of Acts. It involves studying the sign gifts. It involves bringing in some of the issues of the Old Testament, uh, predicting the Gentiles coming in, uh, the Samaritans coming in, the word going out to all the world, God using the Holy Spirit to bring in, uh, basically, uh, uh, to continue for a transition period. This takes some study. You just can't read through the book of Acts and say, oh, look what happened here, look what happened here. This should be going on today. That shows a serious lack of depth. If you really want to know what was going on and what we're to be doing today, you've got to go a lot deeper than that. Why was it different then than it was later in the church? Why was it different later than it is uh, let's say, in, in church history, and then in comparison today. And then you go back and see how the gifts work in Corinthians and how they were so abused, and then you have people taking these uh, alleged gifts, saying what they have today, and saying this is what went on in Acts. That's just pure nonsense. It's leading by emotion. It's leading by false teaching. 
It's leading by experience rather than truth. So if you're caught up in some of these movements, make up your mind. Do you want to follow God's word or do you want to get caught up into the so many traps that are out there? The very t type of obstacles and stumbling blocks that keep believers from truly advancing in their faith. So, in Acts 8, you have the Spirit come to the Samaritans. That's in verses 14 through 17. And then over in uh, the Gentiles, you have it coming with, uh, with Cornelius, and then it carries over into chapter 10. Read the chapters in that context. It'll give you a clear understanding. As I said, there's a couple of the manifestations of it later on. There's a purpose behind that. I have studied through those in the uh, in the videos with you also. If you've studied those videos, you know what I'm referring to. Now, Peter is the one who reached out to the Gentiles first. Okay? And we're back to our subject again. And then later, Paul was appointed as the apostle to the Gentiles. It was always in God's plan to bring in people outside of the Jews. Now, basically, we simplify it by saying there are Jews and there are Gentiles. That's everybody else. I mean, the Samaritans were, were also Gentiles. But because they were mixture, we kind of give them their own designation for a short period of time. But basically, they're Gentiles too. All right? Now, let's go to, it's like we might say in America, we might say, well, those are Indians. Well, there's different tribes of Indians, but they're still considered Indians. Uh, as I recall my history, that was, they were misnamed by Columbus, who thought he had landed in India. All right, 13, let's, well, not 13, uh, Genesis 12, 3, let's look at that. It was always in God's plan to reach out to the Gentiles. Remember this promise to Abraham? I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse you. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. Eventually, it would come. Abraham would have a seed. Remember, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And eventually, through the Jews, would come the seed. And when the Gentile believes upon the seed, Jesus Christ, they too receive blessing from God. Now, this leads us to the second purpose in 15.9. And that the Gentiles, on behalf of his mercy, glorify God. All right, that's the second purpose. Then, just as it is written, it opens up the Old Testament support. But before we get before we get to support, let's understand Christ also came and served so that the Gentiles would receive his mercy. Now we've learned in Romans that the Jewish rejection opened the way for Gentiles to be saved, apart from the law. So we see here that Paul is bringing not just the strong and weak together, but by name the Jew and the Gentile. God brings both of these people together into his program. Now folks, let me, let me make this clear. Uh, if you've heard the word of dispensationalism, one of the major teachings of dispensa dispensationalism is a separation between Jew and Gentile. And they maintain that through much of their teaching. Now, they have modified it. Uh, some have modified it, um, I would say, somewhat drastically, saying there's not such a big separation now. But this is also part of the pre-tribulation teaching that the Gentiles would make up the New Covenant Church. Now, in earlier times, they actually had two different New Covenants. 
that was taught by Ella Schaefer, uh, one of the founding fathers of Dallas Seminary. And uh, this led uh, to enforce the pre-trib rapture. Basically, the Gentiles would be raptured out as the church, leaving the Jews. And that fit well into their scheme. The problem is that's not what the scripture teaches. Now some at the seminary has recognized that and moved away from that older style of dispensationalism, but some still hold on to some of the teaching, including the pre-trib rapture, and they've modified that to fit their scheme also. Now, <clears throat> let's understand that God brings the Jew and Gentiles together. We see this time and time again. We've seen it throughout Romans, and now we see it again here. They are God's people, both of them. That strict separation that we had back under the Old Covenant exists no longer. All right? Even in the tribulation, we see both Jew and Gentile as part of the church going through that together. Yes, the Jews have a uh, particular uh, nation that's formed up, as they will in the millennial period, but the Gentiles are very part, um, very much part of that millennium also. So we see them come together, but yet there is a distinction. Now, I never said there wasn't a distinction, but they do come together as God's people. Uh, you might use the term tribe. They're two different tribes but they're both God's people. All right? Now, the emphasis here that we're looking at is the Gentiles. Christ came to serve the Jews to fulfill their promises, and he's also come to show mercy to the Gentiles, to confirm the promises to the Jews and to bring mercy to to the Gentiles. So that is the first and second purpose here. Christ came for the Jews. He came for the Gentiles. Now, for the next few verses, Paul is going to show Old Testament support <clears throat> for this bringing in of the Gentiles. And this basically relays two messages to the Roman Christians. To the Jews, it tells them, Hey, the Gentiles are part of the family now. I know they haven't got their traditions. They haven't got the, their fathers weren't involved with God in the in past. They don't come from the physical seed of Abraham. They didn't get the promises and the covenants to them directly. They came to us Jews. But now we're going to show how God always intended to open up the program to the Gentiles. And the Gentiles should recognize that the Jews are very much of the program too. They were first. They had the advantages. They had the privileges. And because of their rejection, as we've learned in Romans, you have the privilege of being shown the mercy of God. Now, as Paul begins to show Old Testament support <clears throat> We're going to have, a, have us a pretty good side lesson here for a few moments. Paul will sp provide support from citing a section from, or should I say, I should say, a verse from the law, a verse from the prophets, and a verse from what we call the writings. Let's do a little side lesson here. <clears throat> the law, the prophets, and the writings. If you were to pick up a Hebrew Bible, uh, you would find written on the end of it, not the Holy Bible, but you would find three words stacked on top of each other. Torah. That's the Torah. You would find the next word, 
Navi'im. Transliterations, Navi'im. And then lastly, you would find Kathuvim. The law, the prophets, and the writings. <clears throat> so rather than the Holy Bible, you have these words stacked on top of each other on the side of the text. The Torah, let's talk about the law. That's the simplest. The law is the books of Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. All right, those are easy to list. The prophets, well, that will probably surprise you. Basically, they consider the prophets Joshua, Judges, 1st and 2nd Samuel, 1st and 2nd Kings. You have the story of prophets. And then Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel. And you say, well, where are, uh, where's Daniel? Uh, where's, uh, well, you might say Nehemiah. No, Nehemiah wasn't a prophet. But you don't see Daniel there, do you? He is actually with the writings. The writings, everybody else. Okay? Uh, I can list them. Psalm. Proverbs, uh, Song of Solomon, I left out Job, uh, Ruth, Lamentations, Ecclesiastes, Esther, there's Daniel, Ezra, Nehemiah, and First and Second Chronicles. So this is the Hebrew, this is the Tanakh, the Tanakh. this is the, the Hebrew uh, Bible, all right? Now notice, Paul will quote from Deuteronomy and uh, Isaiah and the Psalms. So he quotes from each section of Scripture. Basically, that's an extra message to the readers that this has scripture support throughout the Old Testament. So, in side lesson, that does make the point that Paul was <clears throat> making it clear that what I'm about to teach is from the Old Testament. Here's what he says. He quotes this line first. Therefore, I will give praise to you among the Gentiles and will sing to your name. This is from Psalm 1849. Psalm 18 is another Psalm of David. David sang this song after he was delivered from his enemies, which included Saul at the time. <clears throat> Let's read through it. I'm going to read through a part of it rather quickly. Let's begin at verse 43. This is a psalm of deliverance from David. <clears throat> you have delivered me from the attacks of the people. You have made me the head of nations. People I did not know now serve me. Foreigners cower before me. As soon as they hear of me, they obey me. Notice the anticipation of what's going to happen in the future. David speaks of the foreigners, people outside 
of the Jewish people now serving him and he's ruling over them. Verse 45, they all lose heart. They come trembling from their strongholds. The Lord lives. Praise be to my rock. Exalted be God my Savior. He is the God who avenges me, who subdues nations under me. This is David again. Who saves me from my enemies. You exalted me above my foes. From a violent man you rescued me. Therefore, I will praise you, Lord, among the nations. I will sing the praises of your name. <clears throat> Just an observation you might be aware of when you read the Psalms. Sometimes the psalmist is speaking, sometimes the Lord is speaking, and then sometimes it looks forward to Jesus Christ. All right? And that can be a little confusing. That's why I like to go through the Psalms, which I will continue to do. But take this last line that's underlined. Therefore, I will praise you, Lord, among the nations. Here we see David anticipating that the Lord would, at some point in the future, be over the entire world. He sings of the nations being subdued by the Lord. Then at the end of these quotes, the last quote, Paul will begin to go back to the root of Jesse, who will rule those nations. Now that's the end of the quote, or the end of this series of quotes giving support for the Gentiles coming in. He brings in the root of Jesse. We'll see that later on. So it looks as though Paul is using David as a typology of Christ when he makes this application. In other words, he takes what David said and forwards it to say this represents the Lord Jesus. So, what happens is David speaks of a future time, this is what it amounts to, when the nations will be together and they will praise the Lord see sometimes the topology is a little difficult to follow but the point is that the Lord will be praised the Lord will be over he'll be ruling over the nations this sets us up to build the next quote upon this point so David excuse me Paul takes a quote from David's psalm which speaks of nations outside of Israel coming under David's rule but eventually this David would turn out to be Christ then at the end of these quotes he's going to mention the root of Jesse another name for the Messiah where he too is said to be ruling over the nations so Paul so Paul is laying the groundwork for us for his next few quotes the first point that we see here from this Old Testament quote is that David anticipates praising God among the nations not just the Jewish people not just Israel and then we come into verse 10, Romans 15, 10. Similar thing. Again, he says, rejoice Gentiles with his people. This is from Deuteronomy 32, 43. This is another quote from the Song of Moses. Remember, we went back to that a while back. Shortly before they entered the land of Israel, Moses sang this song. It was a very informative, or we might even say doctrinal song, that spoke of what God had done for Israel and that basically they're about to go on the land keep in mind that you have a special relationship with God the last line of this song listen to it that's verse 43 Deuteronomy 32 43 rejoice you nations Gentiles with his people Nations is another word for Gentiles. For he will avenge the blood of his servants. He will take vengeance on his enemies. 
and make atonement for his land and people. So here we see again in the second quote in verse 10, Paul building his case from the Old Testament that the Gentiles would be with the people of Israel. So even back to the time of Moses, the Gentiles were anticipated to come in and be among the Jews. And now we know that the Gentiles are equally God's people. The Jews and the Gentiles make up the people of God. So here's the point here. The Gentiles are called to rejoice with God's people. So the Gentiles worship with Israel. Fifteen eleven, the next quote. And again, praise the Lord, all you Gentiles, that all the peoples praise him. Notice, all the peoples. Another quote from Psalm 117. I should say from a psalm. This is 117.1. Now, the thing about Psalm 117.1, uh, this is one of about five psalms that make up what they call the, uh, I think it's the Egyptian Hallel, the Egyptian praise. Uh, it's a series of psalms that praise recalling Israel's deliverance from Egypt. It's the shortest psalm in the Psalter and the shortest chapter in the Bible. Psalm 117. Let's read through the entire psalm. This is it. Two verses. Praise the Lord, all nations. Laud him, all peoples. For great is his love, his mercy, towards us, and the faithfulness, truth of the Lord endures forever. Praise the Lord. Notice some things. All the nations, the Gentiles again, all peoples, the entire world that's saved. Great is his mercy. We've seen that towards the Gentiles. And his truth. Mercy and truth. Notice. And the faithfulness or the truth of the Lord endures forever. So, this is a call for all people around the world to praise the Lord. So the next building block is now we have all people. Now it's as if the Gentiles and Jews are together as God's people. It anticipates it, they do it, and now they're all together. And then we come to the final quote, the one I mentioned earlier, verse 12. And again, Isaiah says, the root of Jesse shall come, and he who rises to rule the nations, in him the Gentiles shall hope. Now, this is Romans 15.12. Okay? This is from Isaiah 11.10. This is from the prophet section. Let's look at Isaiah 10. Now, let me give you just a brief introduction. This section of Isaiah speaks of the Messianic Age. Now, when we use the term Messianic Age, that's another term for the millennium. Uh, as you look at the Old Testament, uh, you don't get the 1,000 years mentioned. You don't get the time in God's plan when it's going to happen. It's basically in the future. That's what they knew. And it was a time when the Messiah would rule. So we call it the Messianic Age. This is what the uh, disciples anticipated uh, both uh, during the time of Jesus and after the time of Jesus. Let's go to a little context here. Let's go back to Isaiah 11, 8. 
Remember, this is a section referring to the, well, what we would call the millennium. The infant will play near the cobra's den, and the young child will put its hand into the viper's nest. Now, this is because all those animals now are what we might call domesticated. Uh, they're not uh, dangerous to a human being anymore at this time. They will neither harm nor destroy on all my holy mountain, for the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Verse 10, here's what's quoted. In that day the root of Jesse will stand as a banner for the peoples. The nations will rally to seek or inquire him, and his resting place, that's his residence, will be glorious. And that day the Lord will reach out his hand a second time to reclaim the surviving remnant of his people, this is the calling in of Israel, from Assyria, from Lower Egypt, from Upper Egypt, from Cush, from Elam, from Babylonia, from Hamath, and from the islands of the Mediterranean. And this is pretty much the known world at that time. Wherever the Jews are, they'll be called back to the land. Verse 12, he will raise a banner for the nations and gather the exiles of Israel. He will assemble the scattered people of Judah from the four quarters of the earth. Now, if we reuse that term today, we pretty much say uh, around from around the world. However you divide it, the northern and southern hemisphere, the eastern and western hemisphere, uh, that's basically the four quarters today. The root of Jesse here designates the Messiah. He will stand as a banner for the people. He will be the one that people gather to, to rally to, we might say. And as they come towards the land of Israel, as we work out the uh, scheme of the millennium after the second advent, they come there to be judged. Those who have trusted in the Messiah will move into the kingdom. Others will be rejected. So, now let's go back to verse 12 of Romans 15. And again, Isaiah says, the root of Jesse shall come, and he, will, and he who rises to rule the nations, in him the Gentiles shall have hope. Here's our new point. This verse shows us, let's go back. This verse shows us that now the Gentiles, their hope is also the same Messiah, the root of Jesse. Look at the verse again. The root of Jesse, now the name for the Messiah, shall come. And he who, rule, and he who rises to rule the nations, that's the Messiah, he'll rule the world. He'll rule the nations of the world. And in him, the Gentiles shall have hope. So, now, the Gentiles are seen on equal basis with Israel. Their hope is also, who? The Messiah. That's Paul's way of giving Old Testament support to the fact that the Gentiles are part of God's program. Now go back to the fact that Paul pulls from every portion of the Hebrew scripture for these quotes. This indicates the Gentiles have been a part of God's plan all along. It was always intended that the Gentiles would come back in as God's people along with Israel. This was no secret. This was no mystery. It's just now we see how it worked out. So in verse 13, Paul turns to a prayer. Listen to this prayer as he closes out this chapter, at least as we divide it in our English Bibles. Now may the God of hope, notice going back to the Gentiles, as Messiah is anticipated hope, fill you with all joy and peace as you believe so that you will abound in hope there's the word hope again, by the power of the Holy Spirit. Some very significant things here. Again, notice, now may the God of hope. 
Now may the God of hope, God is the hope for both Jew and Gentile. So the request by Paul is that the God of hope, the source of hope, the one who provides hope, fill you with all joy and peace, whether they be Jew or Gentile, weak or strong. Paul, Paul prays that God will fill them with joy and inner happiness that sometimes expresses itself outwardly. Also, peace. The peace that one has with God that extends over into mutual harmony with other believers. So, he prays, wishes, that the God of hope fill them with joy, fill them with peace. And then the third element, as you believe. Literally, this says, in believing. And we translate it, as you believe. The idea is that as you keep on believing in, in, in your active faith, here's the purpose, second part of the verse so that you will abound in hope. Do you see that? So that you will abound in hope. I just love this scripture because it has so much in it. This is Paul's wish prayer for the Jew and Gentiles. After going through all these issues of their division, he now prays that you will be filled. Let me write this down. I'm getting excited about this. You will be filled with joy peace so that you will abound in hope you see and don't miss this last line this last line look at this verse 13 by the power of the Holy Spirit this joy and peace and abounding in hope all come by the power of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is who God uses to bring these things about in our lives. The Holy Spirit is who God uses to bring these things about our lives. That's the Father's plan. The Holy Spirit is activated in us to bring about joy and peace so that our hope becomes a reality. Do you begin to understand why I so emphasize the Holy Spirit in our life? If we're not utilizing His power, we're not reaching the joy, we're not experiencing the peace, we're not developing the hope that we have. You know what hope is? Let me tell you what hope is. Right now, you should be living by faith, right? Every day, everything you do. Some of the teaching of Paul also. We live by faith. Faith is an anticipated is hope being fulfilled in the, in the future. Let me say that another way. Hope is faith looking forward to the future. Hope is faith looking forward to the future. Well, let's look at our verse one more time, verse 13. I want to get some principles in here before we close. Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you believe, so that you will abound in the hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. And let me encourage you here. You ask God in your prayers to have the Holy Spirit increase these Christian graces in your life. Increase your joy. Increase the peace so that you can have a more solid hope. Now, I would like us to close with a, what have I got here, 18 point review on our section here but that went all the way back to 14.1. So this is basically a review from 14.1 to 1513. This gathers some of the principles. Uh, there's a lot of application here. 
and I want to work through some of these points to make sure that there's not any confusion. Let's do 1 through 6 first. They're familiar, so we can go through them fairly rapidly. Move that over. Okay. 1. Paul begins by telling the mixed audience of Gentile, the strong, and the Jew, the weak, to accept one another and not to judge. I think we got that. 2. The differing opinions would be over food, drink, and days in view of the Mosaic Law. 3. The Jew would avoid certain foods and drinks and set aside certain days to keep the law. 4. The Gentiles were not restricted as to food, drink, and days because they did not follow the Mosaic Law. 5. Now since today we do not have this problem with the mixed Jewish and Christian audience with these issues, there is no direct application here for us. I emphasize the word direct. I doubt that you have many people in your Christian church or in Christian gathering, perhaps even in your Christian um, acquaintances or Jewish acquaintances that still live by the Mosaic Law. Otherwise, they wouldn't be Christians. Six. However, we can take some of the principles with a limited, extended application for today. And I must admit, I am hesitant in this because the application is so flexible and so personal, you don't want to say this is the way it always is. It just depends on the situation. It's something where we as Christians have to evaluate and be discerning and make our best decision in our particular circumstances. And it's going to vary tremendously. It may be a close family member. It may be a distant family member, a close friend, an acquaintance, you see. So all these things are taken into account when you apply these principles and this extended application. Let's go to point seven. Those who are serving Christ should allow others to grow and serve without judging them. Now, this could be read a couple different ways. Let me make clear the way I want you to read it. Those who are serving Christ, this is referring to a growing positive believer, a believer who is positive towards God, towards His Word, and wants to live obediently. Those who are serving Christ should allow others to grow and serve without judging them. This would be uh, to the weak believer, but also in general to the strong believer. Allow others to grow. 8. We are to remember that Christ is the Lord of us all, that we will all stand before the judgment seat of Christ, and that we will all live. We are and that we all are to live and die for Christ. 9. The fundamental principle here, to love one another with the objective of building up in the faith, building up, the building up of another in the faith, and tear no one down. 10. Do not cause offense toward the weak, the young, and growing believer. 11. If necessary, keep what you know to yourself so as not to offend. 12. Do not do anything that would cause another to violate his conscience. Now, this is such a broad application. It comes to what you drink. It may apply to alcoholic beverages. It might have uh, apply the other things that some Christians will do and others won't for different reasons. This is something that you have to sort out on an individual basis. Uh, if you were to ask me what am I supposed to do, well I, first thing I'd have to basically interrogate you to find out all the facts I can. What is What about them? What about you? What is your thinking on it? What is your thinking on it? Where have they been? What's their background? And you can see how you're really in the best position to make these decisions. This is where counseling can get off base because you try to basically make decisions for people and that's not what counseling is supposed to do. 
you're supposed to get the information. Yes, you can ask the information, but then you take that information and you filter it through what you know of the Word of God and you make your own application. That's the way it's designed for us to do. That's how we spiritually grow. And we may be wrong. We're going to make mistakes. We may make the wrong applications. You may say later on, like I do, but I wish I knew then what I knew now. So, point 12 again. Do not do anything that would cause another to violate his conscience. I had to repeat that because verse 13, or point 13, builds on that. This is the rest of the points. This could lead um, to be, I should have put two in there, to be an obstacle or even worse, a trap, so that he would fall in his faith. In other words, if you cause another one to, call, to break his conscience, that was uh, point 12, this could lead to be an obstacle or even worse, a trap, so that he would fall in his faith. 14. All believers are to be using their faith in whatever they do doesn't line up with the Word of God. Are you believing it? Are you applying it? Are you in the power of the Spirit? 15. Stronger believers are to bear the burden of the weaker growing believer. Paul came back to that principle. 16. Love one another. Accept one another. This brings glory to God. Just look at it this way. Which brings more glory to God? To get in a big argument and dispute over something? Or just say, we're going to agree to disagree? 17. Just as God has always planned for the Gentiles to become God's people, and, the Jew, and that the Jews have been God's people, both should recognize that God wants them to get along and come together as the body of Christ. Now this comes back to our Romans situation with Paul. 18. So also, believers weak and strong should be considerate and non judgmental, loving one another, willing to be flexible and accepting of others, and not make non essential issues a reason to divide. Well, that ends this section in Romans 15, and we'll continue here next time. Let's pray. Well, Heavenly Father, we thank you again for your word. We thank you that you have given us so much truth so that we can make right decisions according to your will so we can live an obedient life. We ask that in the power of the Spirit, you will challenge us with what we've learned today and then in the power of the Spirit that we will apply these things to our own circumstances. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.